I do hope that uh, in the first half and through the break, you've been bottling up those questions. Uh, it'll be intriguing to know what you guys have been thinking whilst we've been listening this evening. But uh, maybe to kick questions off through the wonders of modern technology, um, my little pad here uh, is loaded with questions that have been coming in on Twitter from our audience at home. Thank you very much for sending them through. From uh, uh, this question, probably for you, uh, uh, Toby, from uh, Tech New You, if organ donation was compulsory, would we need xenotransplantation? Oh, <laughs> that's a that's a very difficult question. The 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 truth of the matter is that um, we don't have enough um, people who die in in the appropriate circumstances to be able to give the organs that we need. So um, we even even where we currently are, and as I said at the beginning, um, ideally, if we could expand. Um, the range of people that we could we could transplant, we would certainly even need even more uh, organ donors than we currently have. Having having said that, I will bring up one thing that came up in discussion just then, and that is that I will tell you that we look very very hard at every person who dies in any hospital who's potentially uh, appropriate for an organ donor, and we will use organs uh, even up to the age of 80 and even above um, if we possibly can. So we we really don't waste anything. Could I add? Oh, yeah. please jump in there. Yeah. yeah. Going back to my theme of the question of, of, of a society that thrives, do we actually really want to be part of a world that says, when you die, we will take your organs? Is, is that something that we want to do? Well, it's got to be better than waking up in a Bangkok hotel with uh, oh, you know, a bar full of ice. And, and a bucket kidney. of ice and all yeah. of those sorts of things. Uh, uh, just out of curiosity, um, I, is that just an urban legend or does that sort of thing actually happen? Is, is the traffic <laughs> and, a market in, there is in a organs? There is, is a, is there a really market in it, but often uh, it's, it's more people in impoverished societies who sell theirs or most uh, um, notoriously recently a young fellow in China who sold his for an iPad, so that was slightly problematic. Um, but, um, Did he get 4G? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let, maybe we should move along. Um, <coughs> Sorry, you but wanted I'll to... just sort of add that... Yes, please. That on the numbers basis alone, I mean, if that question is, you know, if we got every dead person's XYZ organs, would we need... If you think about diabetes, <coughs> you think about juvenile onset diabetes, it's half a percent of the population have juvenile onset diabetes. All of these people would be potential candidates for a, a if, if, if it was a perfected technology for a pancreatic islet transplant, whether human or other, you know. So that could never be solved. If, that were to, if transplantation is to be the solution for diabetes, it will not ultimately be by human to human transplantation. In fact, it's fair to say that human-to-human -human transplantation is only a test bed for xenotransplantation. If, you know, because you, will ne you never deal with the numbers. And uh, Toby will tell you the numbers that have been done of islet transplants, but there are three programs in Australia, one of which is in his hospital, one of which is in my hospital, and one of which is in Sydney. And between them, I think they've done about 25? 17. 17 transplants and that's over a period of more than five years now uh, so the that alone tells you that if transplantation is a solution for diabetes it isn't going to be via human to human and that the expertise we gain and the skills we gain in doing the human to human transplant will then be applicable to a xenotransplant and that would then be a while we've Smoother got you there, passage. Tony, um, a, a question that's come through which would allow you to elaborate on what you were talking about earlier. Would animal organs be as... <coughs> Do you think that they'll be uh, giving us new eyes from pigs soon? Because I cannot read this. Yeah. <laughs> would animal organs be as good as human organs or would they be inferior in function? Um, this is the pages of the book issue. I mean, you, you don't know the answer to a lot of things until you reach that, you know, th that point. Wait, wait till you've done it, and then therefore until you've got some experience with it. But you can, you can 
broadly answer that, that as probably no. In other words, uh, the best organ I've got is my own. The next best one will be somebody else's. And then the third best will be an animal uh, organ. And I don't think that rank order is ever going to, <laughs> ever going to uh, change. Because you know, my own army and somebody else's, well, we can, they're nearly me and we can bash them into shape with some immunosuppression and so forth. Uh, but the amount of changing and the amount of immunosuppression required of an animal organ is more and the physiological compatibility may never be quite right. Uh, if, yeah. You want to add so yeah, something I'd there? I'd also like to, to add, I mean, when we're talking about transplants, um, you have to think also about the quality of the organ that we're going to transplant. And yep. th the truth of the matter is that uh, the, you mentioned at the beginning, Paul, that you know, the, the common perception is that the people who donate organs are young you know, road accident vehicle uh, victims, and that's certainly not the case. The majority of people who donate their organs are people in their 50s and 60s who die usually from strokes in hospital. Now that's an organ, I'm not going to say it's the fish that John West rejects, but it's an organ that's been around the track <laughs> a bit, okay. And 60 it's not years. 60 years, yeah. and it's not going to be as good as an organ that you might get from somebody, you know, much, much younger. And xenotransplantation, because potentially offers you, a, if you like, a, a pristine younger organ that may work, you know, have a longevity greater than, than what conventional transplantation can add. Now, Tony's absolutely right. We don't yet know whether that's going to be the reality, but you would think logically that that might, that might be the case. But one other thing I'd, I'd just add into this is if you're com making the comparison between what we call an allo transplant, a human to human transplant, and a xenotransplant. With allo transplantation, patients are committed to lifelong immunosuppressive therapy. That's the nature of the business. Uh, so that they must have immunosuppression and with all the side effects that have been mentioned. And that is an issue. Now, one of the things that we are doing at present is we're generating pigs with inbuilt immunosuppression. This is one of the things that you can do in xenotransplantation that you can't do in an allotransplant because I can't genetically manipulate Toby before he dies <laughs> to fix me up when he has died. <laughs> or I can't genetically manipulate his organ after he's died before it goes into me. But what I can Toby's do, looking a little shaky <laughs> there, actually. <laughs> I'm putting yeah, a, lot of, a lot of <laughs> pressure on Toby. <laughs> but, uh, but what we can do, and what we are currently doing, is generating pig organs which contain anti-human uh, uh, antibodies against the human immune cells so that you create like a halo, like a, a, a force field around the kidney or the pancreatic islet that prevents the, uh, the injuring cells, my immune system, penetrating into that organ. And so that, that, that can be built in genetically into a pig organ. And that, that's what we... So as you turn the pages, what we found is that we had to solve this problem then we had to solve this and now we're at the fifth set of genetic modifications we're adding in and the ones that we're adding in at present are immunosuppressive genes. How far away are we from the idea of you've got cancer, you know that you're going to have to have an organ donation down the path so we can take a part of that, we can grow it in an animal and then transplant it back so it's your material You've just used an animal donor as an incubator. Right. Well, there are two, questions, two, two answers that are... In ten words or less. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're a long way away. Uh, and first of all, uh, the solution of growing them in an animal is probably not the one to go for uh, because it's still a xenotransplant. In other words, you still have all the, the, the negatives of it being a, another species uh, thing. It might be grown from my cells, but it will end up incorporating animal. And so therefore remains xeno, 
and therefore has all the difficulty. But the other area of research that Australia has a big group uh, working in is in, if you like, growing organs uh, from my cells in a, uh, on a scaffold, in a bucket, you know, or in a flask like that one over there or, or whatever. Um, and so that this is the technology of stem cell uh, re you know, production of organs and tissues. And again, that's easiest to produce cells rather than organised organs. But all of that is happening uh, at present. Okay, I believe we have a question uh, up towards the back of the theatre. I don't know if this has been addressed before, but I was wondering about viruses, about the possibility of yeah. transferring over. Absolutely. Uh, this is a critical question. So, the things that there are three things that we've got to deal with to get xenotransplantation to the clinic. One's efficacy, and all the work I'm talking about is about making it work so that it's efficacious, so that it doesn't, so it doesn't fail, number one. Number two, or for the moment I'll make number two, ethics. Is this all, does it pass the should we do it test? And the third one is, is it safe? Now, your question is about, is it safe? The, the answer to this question is it will be made safe. Uh, it will, so that the thing about pigs is that you can put them inside barriers, you can make sure that those pigs are free of every virus that you can name because you can breed them through several generations, you can test them uh, through all of those generations and you can make absolutely sure that they contain nothing at all that we know. Now, the question then is, but what about we don't know? Because we didn't know about AIDS and we didn't know about this and we didn't know about that. The answer is we will never know all the things that we never know. But what we can <laughs> do is within safe, reasonable limits, we can exclude all the things that we do know and then we can take material from the patients we transplant, blood, samples of organs, from the pigs that we use as the donors, etc., and we can bank all of that so that into the future, if anything ever did happen, we would be able to go back and find out what, what that was about. And so that through a process of stringent, if you like, uh, husbandry of the animals on the one side and testing, and through monitoring into the future, we can, between those two, we can give you as high a level of certainty as you can. You would be much more at risk of walking out this door and in that narrow laneway there, which is a, a whole lot of big posts in it being run down by a bus, than the likelihood of, it, of you getting some, uh, something out of one of these animals. I believe Toby wants to add a comment I might, here. I might just add something on to, to what Tony very eloquently said. Um, and the truth of the matter is that there are, there are populations of pigs that are extremely pure um, that, believe it or not, were dropped off by sailing ships in the, in the early part of the 19th century on a number of islands around the place um, that lack a number of the viruses that, that you were uh, alluding to. And those pigs, um, you may have, some of you may have heard of this trial that's been undertaken in New Zealand uh, where those pigs have been used as uh, pancreatic islet donors and transplanted in now to uh, 10 uh, human volunteers without any immunosuppression at all. And uh, this addresses the eff efficacy question. Mm. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like they've been terribly uh, good at treating the diabetes in the long term. But the one thing we can take away from that trial is at least the viruses that we can detect have not been uh, <coughs> demonstrated to be transmitted into humans. So it's a, I think a very positive, that's a very positive step and it's something that's actually already happened. Uh, Bernadette, while we're talking about little piggies, another question coming in from uh, Twitter is that the pigs are social animals. What are the ethics of using intelligent animals? So does that actually change the ethical picture if an animal is considered sentient or intelligent? Would we be having this discussion if we were talking about xenotransplantation from slime mould? Slime mould, perhaps not. Um, I think it comes back down to... Um, how we as humans treat lesser, lesser beings and uh, 
I do not know an awful lot, to be honest, about the social structure of pigs, but I, I do believe that they are, I have, from what I've read, they are a social um, animal. Um, yes, it does raise ethical considerations, and yes, it is something that has to be taken into account, but um, it, it's part of that ends and means and the balancing act, and, uh, and we do have very um, strict controls over the uh, use of um, animals in science and they do involve um, minimalising the harm um, in using a, as small a number as is needed. Um, and basically it comes down to a respect. But don't we have uh, a certain different ethics if we're talking about using animals in a medical setting rather than, say, in a food setting? Uh, for example, when, if you go back to the GM debates, uh, everyone was complaining, or, and those who were complaining were complaining about manipulating animals for uh, genetically okay. for food, but when it came to manipulating them for various medical procedures, such as uh, uh, for the production of insulin, not a beep, because that was a different playing field. Well, perhaps that comes down to that weighing, down, weighing again, the ends to make food more tasty, or the ends to further um, health. So I guess that's, that really is exactly pointing that out. It's that weighing up of the different factors and that ans asking of the question of do the um, ends justify the means. Okay, we have another question from the floor. Further to the virus question, could you explain please why it is that viruses seem to be able to cross the species barrier but cells and organs can't? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't actually uh, ever put it in my mind in that context. Um, okay, so a virus is itself an independent living organism. And a bit like... Uh, <coughs> it, it has to have an environment that it wants to survive in. Now, that, that survival is inside... Many of these viruses survive in cells. The ones, the ones that people are concerned about. I'm not going to talk about, you know, the, the common cold type virus, but the ones that people are concerned about survive inside the cells. So that those viruses have to adapt. Uh, they have, first of all, to get into a cell, they've got to be a receptor that, that picks them up and takes them in. Now, it's the structure of the virus and the human cells um, receptors. Now these humans don't have receptors for viruses. They weren't born, you know, we, our, our ontogeny is not such that we sort of gear ourselves to have a receptor for a virus. What happens is the various cell surface molecules that we have by accident are, are if you like, well it isn't actually by accident, become the receptors for a virus. And those viruses modify themselves until, if you like, they find, by luck, uh, a key. And it's so like they picking enter. a lock. Yeah. yeah. And so that the, the entry of viruses into cells is, is after mutation and mutation and mutation that has found a, a fit. Now, all of these viruses out there that we're concerned about live in the animal world. They are already adapted for some animals' uh, locks and keys. And the, the question is, what are we going to do about that getting into the human? Well, the thing that you can do about it is that you can, as best you can, prevent any of those viruses being in them during this time in quarantine, if you like. You breed the animals for several generations. You detect if you can. If you know about them, you can detect them. I mean, that's basically it. And then you, you clean the pigs of those, uh, and y there are a number of ways of doing that, clearing it out. And so that there is no absolute certainty about anything in this world, but as with, with a high level of confidence, you can prevent that, that transmission process. Okay, we do have another question from the floor. Yes, good evening. One of the questions I have, which probably a number of different views will come up on, 
What would it take for the default legal position to be that people are organ donors unless they opt out? Um, no, it's over to you. <laughs> Look, that's, that's actually very much an ongoing debate around the world. And um, in fact, the evidence from Spain, which led the opt-out, um, for those of you who aren't aware of what that is, is we are, our default position is that we have to opt in. We have to say, yes, we will be an organ donor. In the opt-out um, countries, you have to actually opt out. You have to say, no, I positively don't want to. Now, the evidence um, from Spain is that they argue that it was actually education, that it was not changing to the opt-in. And then we go to Greece, and a lot of people say that the Greek, Greek personality is a little bit similar to the Australian personality. What happened is that they had not very many people opting in, but they still had a few, right? They still had a reasonable rate. And then they in introduced an opt-out system, at which point the society was galvanised. People said, you're not taking my organs, you're not telling me what to do. So that galvanised the community to go and actively opt out. So it backfired, so they then got rid of it, and now they've sort of gone back to a level, level playing field. So there's a lot of research being done on it, and at the moment it would appear that whilst it seems like a fix, it's not actually practically a fix. Interesting that that's occurred in Spain and Greece, who've been making headlines for other reasons mm. in recent months. So we have a question from the floor. Actually, it's, it's not really a question. I wanted to say something a couple of minutes ago when you were speaking, because what you were saying about viruses just into my head that what about the Hendra virus? That kills the horses and the, and the people. Does that fit with what you were saying, or have I misunderstood you? Yeah, I mean, something like the Hendra virus comes out of bat, bat urine and drops on and now, inside a, the facility that you keep these pigs in is a closed facility. And by closed, I mean, you know, roof and floor, walls and, and sides. These, these animals uh, are bred, you know, and bred for generations inside a completely closed system. People shower in and shower out. You know, that's the sort of level of, of containment. Uh, so that... The Hendra virus is, is, is an example, a bit like the cold, if you like. In other words, somebody has to bring it and, and, and put it in there for anybody to get infected. So I don't think that... I think we can keep the pigs clean and we can test the pigs on a regular basis to know that they're clean. And so uh, while Hendra virus is a, is, a, is a scourge, it's not one that's going to be a problem or anything like Hendra will not be a problem. I have a question coming from Twitter which lends itself to all kinds of possibilities. Is there a limit to the number of xenotransplanted organs that one person can handle? Is it possible that we could see the day where we just keep going and going and going, replacing organs as they clap out so that eventually we end up 90% pig? <laughs> Actually, I think that's already happened in some cases, but let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, <I'd laughs> I, I think in my lifetime, the pr practical reality will be one at a time, thanks. And, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I think if we uh, can achieve one, we'll, we'll have done very well. OK, uh, do we have any more questions from the floor? Oh, we do have one over here. I'll tell you what, I'll come over here and the camera will follow me around. We'll get that camera over there. You watch any minute now. It'll come. Look, here he comes. Here he comes. Oh, look, look, look. Smile. <laughs> okay, and your question, sir. I accept that we're going to ha use pigs. Otherwise, my question would be for Paul and ask why would he want pigs' eyes when he could have the eyes from a cat. But we're using pigs. How long do pig organs last? That's a good question. I would have thought that perhaps my heart, you know, a 50 something year old heart, has got a longer use by date than a brand new pig heart? Well, um, that's a good question. The, so what we're used to is uh, pigs, pigs living about uh, 18 months to two years because we kill them. Uh, that's what we breed them for. We breed them to die when they're in absolute 
prime condition uh, at about uh, 100 kilos. So uh, for th that's another interesting thing about pigs is that you can, they, they grow wonderfully fast uh, and to any size that we require so that we can take a pig at any point. But how long will their organs last? Well, I think that there are some answers to that from human transplantation and that we know that 70-year-old organs are not uh, quite as good as 25-year-old organs. But nevertheless, take my kidneys out and they'll probably go another 30 or 40 years. I won't die uh, because of wearing out in that sense of, of most physiological functions. Yes, our physiologic functions do decline. But the answer with a pig is I, I simply don't know. They normally die at around 25, 20 to 25 years if, you know, left. And I don't mean in the wild because nothing survives as long in the wild as they will in other circumstances. But pigs will live about that long. The average survival of a kidney transplant uh, today is about 12 to 15 years. I think that's correct. And so... Uh, I think if we can do that well, we'll have done very well. We have another question from the floor. Um, I was wondering what drives the legislative process. Like, when do we know enough to start having legislation to manage this sort of transplantation? Who drives it? Like, does it... Who initiates that public process? Public debate, public policy, um, political agendas, need lobbies, piece of string. But we don't actually need legislation. To do, to do this today, the, the, it's already been through a series of processes that tell us how we're going to go forward. If tomorrow I can come along with a good enough story uh, that says, I reckon I can put, let's say, pancreatic islets into humans and that it'll be safe and I would then go to the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, who've been tasked with sorting this out. Now, the TGA has not yet sorted out how it's going to sort it out, but my application would start them doing that. And they would then say, well, tell us about this, this and this. They would probably take the American, the FDA guidelines on xenotransplantation as a working document or something close to it, and they would then start putting me through the, a series of, if you like, jump this hurdle, convince us that, oh, that the, it'll be safe. In other words, tell us how you're going to do what I've said we'd do about the viruses, about you know, the containment facilities. You prove to me that this will be all right. Tell me th what you've done in baboons. You know, in other words, show me that it's going to work because we're not going to talk to you unless you can really convince me that this is likely to work in humans. And one of the great difficulties for us as researchers is a baboon is an extraordinarily hard uh, test bed. You know, a human gets sick, they tell you, I'm sick, doc. My back hurts, my knee's crook, or whatever it is. A baboon doesn't. Uh, it, it is a... And they are extremely hard animals to, uh, to, if you like, to perfect a technology in. But that's what we have to do. And so that by the time we've perfected it in baboons to a point where an authority says, OK, that looks efficacious, then I think it'll be really ready to go in humans who are much easier to work with. What we're and talking course, about, oh. baboons, um, wasn't the first xenotransplant a baboon heart into a human? The first. I'm it's not going sure. back to the, the late 80s or the early 90s. Baby, yeah, baby five. Yeah, that was a chimp. Uh, a chimpanzee, I think. Chimpanzee but heart. I, th I thought it was a baboon. Well, uh, Tom Starzl did six or eight baboons. Uh, used six or None of them worked. One of the problems of using higher primates is this virus problem. Mm. Higher primates are deadly to humans as, as transplanting 
uh, as a transplant source. They have a number of viruses that are built in that we already have the capacity to be infected by, and you can't get rid of them. It, they're in, endogenous to the animal. So we would not use a higher primate as a donor. In addition to all of that, uh, none of the higher primates are big enough for an adult. If you think about a heart, for example, the biggest of the, of the higher primates wouldn't do uh, a 70 kilo adult. Uh, so primates are not going to be used. I, I remember the, uh, the, my colleague uh, Norman Swan from Radio National was interviewing the guy who did that for uh, the Baby Faye, transplant. And, yeah. and it was in that interview that we found out that he's a creationist. And so they asked, why did you use a primate's heart? Well, you know, isn't there an evolutionary reason there? Oh, no, 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 not at all. It's just, it's just a similar heart, so I can use it. Yeah. Up the back. My memory says that the kidney, the human kidney, secretes a hormone, or, what, or several, and certainly the heart and the human kidney respond to human hormones. What happens to pig organs in relation to their response to human hormones? Right, and that, that, that's, that's a good question because it brings up this whole question of physiologic compatibility. Forget about the immunology and whether we have to solve that. Will these organs uh, respond to and, uh, and, and you know, vice versa, the, the hormones? Now, <coughs> So if you start at the very smallest area, the pancreatic islets. Pancreatic islets relevantly respond to glucose, to sugar. And so sugar is sugar. But there is a different set point. So that a pig's blood sugar runs just a little lower than ours. So that what you would expect is that if the pig insulin, which we respond to, uh, the islet cells will set our blood sugar level just a fraction lower. Not, and, and this is not expected to be a problem because it is just a little lower. Come to the heart. The heart is quite interesting. It responds to very simple chemicals rather like sugar. The catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline and so forth. So that these are not different between the species. So that you would expect a pig heart to respond in exactly the same way as a human heart to those chemicals. In the other direction, the heart only really makes one uh, molecule called atrial natriuretic peptide. And that uh, is not a, it's not something that we know whether it works in the opposite direction. But it's a pretty simple molecule and I suspect the answer is it, it will be the same. Nobody's looked up to my knowledge. When you come to the liver, your question is exactly uh, the issue. A liver makes everything that we have circulating in our bloodstream or in large proportion of it and it responds to a, a massive amount. I think that would be a big challenge. But as a short term uh, if you like, garbage disposal unit to, to prevent death from liver failure, if it can keep somebody alive for four or five days a week, uh, that would be a sufficient time as a bridge to a, an allo transplant. So I think that there are, there are issues and we don't know all of the answers. And in particular, we don't know the answers with kidneys. And one of the things that we've observed with, with baboons is that they secrete a lot more phosphate in their urine than, than we do. And maybe, uh, this is after a pig transplant, and maybe that'll be a problem. I know that we could carry on for a lot longer. There's a lot of questions to be asked and answered. We do need to draw things to a close. And before we do that, we need to go back to our clicker pad questions, ladies and gentlemen. Can you grab your cl clicker pads, please? And we'll just go through these four questions again and then we'll look at the results. And I also want to get some answers from our distinguished panel this evening. So, question number one. Do you think it is ethical... Sorry. Do you think there is a need 
to transplant animal organs into humans? Yes, no, or undecided? Your time starts now. Seven, six. Okay, let's go to the next question. Oh, okay, here we go. Before the event, 61% of the audience said yes, 17% said no, and 22 are undecided. At the end of the event? Whoa! <laughs> We've managed to sow the seeds of confusion this evening, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. That's a, well, that's, that, that's an interesting result. Is that unexpected for you, Bernadette, it, uh, being an ethical question? Hmm. that when we actually start discussing it, 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 it raises no. more questions Look, um, and answers? I, uh, I teach uh, an elective called Medical Law and Ethics, and law students are incredibly certain human beings, and they're always cross with me by the end of it, because I do a similar thing. I ask them a set of questions at the start, then we discuss it for a semester, then I ask them the same set of questions, and they almost universally say to me, the really annoying thing about this subject is I'm less certain at the end than I was at the beginning. So these are the sorts of issues that once you start discussing them, you think, oh, mm, I thought I knew, but actually we don't, because I'm, I'm quite honest, most of the time I don't know the answer. Interesting stuff. Are we going to go for another question? Okay, the next, okay, let's try this one. Do you think it is technically possible to transplant animal organs into humans? One yes, two no, three undecided. Your time, you have eight seconds, seven. Okay, now before the event, you said that 95% of you said that it was possible. No one said it wasn't. 5% were undecided. What about after the event? <laughs> We really have done a lot to throw the, <laughs> sow the seeds of confusion tonight, haven't we? This is a fascinating uh, response. Probably a response uh, from you, Tony. Does that surprise you? Oh, I'd, I'd be in the undecided. I would vote undecided. I, I think that we're, we are not yet at a stage where, you know, I would be happy to put an organ into a human. But will I be able to in five or ten years' time? Well, not me and my successes, uh, I'm undecided. I hope, but I'm not certain. Fascinating. Okay, let's do another one. This is, this is, this is good. I like this bit. Do you think it is ethical to try... Hang on, we've just done, done that one, haven't we? No, we haven't? Okay. Do you think it is ethical to transplant... Okay. Do you think it is ethical to transplant animal organs into humans? Yes, no, undecided. Is it ethical to proceed with xenotransplantation? Yes, no, undecided. Five seconds, four, three. Now, before the event, 48% said it was ethical, 13% no, 39% were undecided. After the event, not a lot of change. Not a lot of change there. So, uh, Bernadette, again, sorry, uh, as an ethical point, oh. that doesn't surprise you, does it? <laughs> What about, what, what about you, Toby? Does that surprise you? Um, I, I think... No, no, sorry, <coughs> sorry. I wanted Toby. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, I think it's a very interesting response, and it's, um, I think it reflects very much um, when you try to get people to, well, people to consent for mm. a number of procedures, this is pretty much the response you would expect. OK, let's go for the last of the four questions. Do you think xenotransplantation is, one, ready for the clinic? Two, nearing clinical use. Three, several years away from implementation. Or four, it's just early research. One, two, three, or four, ten seconds. Okay, now before the event, the stats look like this. 48% thought it was several years away from implementation, almost half the audience. And then 29%, so just under a third, nearing clinical use. And then it came as to either early research or ready for the clinic. What about after the event? <laughs> what a dramatic shift there we have there. So not ready for the clinic at all. Nearing clinical use, 9%, not even one in 10. 39% uh, 
uh, 38, 39% uh, early research, 52% slight increase there. What is, uh, the, the Toby, what do you make of those numbers? Do they make sense? Toby uh, or Tony? Okay, well, I think, I think, I'm, I think you've got a discerning audience. <laughs> 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 and I think the distinction between I started in this 20 odd years ago thinking that in 10 years I'd have it solved. Uh, now that's 22 years has passed and uh, uh, I, I'm not sure whether I'm still in early research or uh, several years away, but it's one of the answers. One of those two columns is correct. Okay, so now which camera am I going to? I'm going to uh, this camera over here. All right, look, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> It's time to wrap up the evening. Um, we have lots of thank yous that have to be done because, let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, Toby, Tony and Bernadette were fabulous. Were they not? Please, a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Also, a big thank you to the event sponsor, the National Enabling Technologies Strategy. Uh, thanks to Ben Lewis and the rest of the RIOS crew for making this happen out the back there. Let's give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And the bar staff as well. <laughs> Got to thank the bar staff. They're serving us drinks. Uh, and also from me, thank you to the audience both here and at home. And a, a quick plea, we do depend on donations to keep going. There is a donation jar on the way out. And if you're looking at home, there's also a donation button on the website. Please <laughs> do uh, contribute to the cause. Thank you for coming along tonight. Have a wonderful and safe evening. Thank you very much.